Welcome to the 40th Annual Preaching with Power, sponsored by the Urban Theological Institute of United Lutheran Seminary. For 40 years, our seminary has hosted this annual spring event, bringing to our community the finest in African-American preaching. And on today, during our chapel worship hour, the Reverend Dr. Janet J. Sturdivant, presiding elder of the South District of the Philadelphia Annual Conference of the African Methodist Episcopal Church and former chair of Utica, the Urban Theological Institute Committee of Advisors, is our preacher. Listen, as you celebrate preaching with power with us, we ask that you consider a gift to the Urban Theological Institute, to one of our scholarship funds. Just contact us here at United Lutheran Seminary, and you can always mail a donation uh, to our Philadelphia campus to the attention of UTI. Now we will have greetings from the president of our seminary, the Reverend Dr. R. Guy Irwin. Following our president, seminarian Veronica Reynolds will share in prayer and scripture reading. We'll have a musical selection from Scott Cumbermatch. Following him, the Reverend Albert Johnson, our current chair of Utica, will introduce our preacher. I'm Dr. Guy Irwin, president of United Lutheran Seminary, and I welcome you in the name of God to this worship service today. Today's worship service has several functions. It is at the same time our seminary's normal Wednesday midweek worship service and also the center part of the Preaching with Power program put on by the Urban Theological Institute over the last few days. The preacher today is the Reverend Dr. Janet J. Sturdivant. You'll hear more about her later. But I want to welcome you all into the presence of God. Open your hearts and your minds to receive the word and may we all be richly blessed by what we hear. A reading from Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cry to you for help and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul from Sheol, restored me to life from among those who have gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you had established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face and I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried and the Lord, I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down in the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks to you forever. Amen. Thank you. 
My beloved, it is with a great deal of joy and tremendous humility that I have the opportunity to present our preacher for the hour as we celebrate this 40th anniversary of Preaching with Power. The Reverend Janet Jenkins Sturdivant is no stranger to us here at United Lutheran Seminary. Not only is she an alum, but she also served as the past chair of the Utica Advisory Board. And as the current chair, I can't express to you how proud I am to have this opportunity to present her to you. The Reverend Dr. Janet Jenkins Sturdivant is the presiding elder of the South District of the Philadelphia Annual Conference of the First Episcopal District of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. The Reverend Dr. Janet Sturdivant is a woman of many firsts. She is the first woman to ever preach the annual sermon in the Mother Conference of African Methodism since its organization in 1817. Her sermon title was, Whose Report Will You Believe? She is also the first woman to pastor Asbury AME Church in Chester, Pennsylvania. She was the first woman to host the Delaware Annual Conference in the First Episcopal District of our wonderful church. The Reverend Dr. Janice Sturdivant received her Doctor of Ministry at Lutheran Theological Seminary in May 2008. Her project topic is the woman's journey to the pastorate in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She has many personal accomplishments. She was the Dean of the Ministerial Institute at the Delaware Annual Conference. She was one of only three preachers selected to preach the Super Soul Fest in Bermuda alongside Bishop John Bryant and the Reverend William Watley. We can go on and on and on and on and on and on talking about this tremendous woman of God. She is an instructor at Lutheran and Payne seminaries teaching AME history and polity. She is also the secretary of the Connectional Presiding Elders Council of the AME Church. But more importantly, she is just a tremendous woman of God. She was married to the Reverend Michael W. Sturdivant, pastor of Trinity AME Church here in the Philadelphia Conference. Together they share a daughter, two sons, three grandchildren, and two godchildren. Presiding Elder Sturdivant, she is saved, she is sanctified, she is filled with the Holy Spirit, and she is not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation, first to the Jews and then to the Greeks. Her life's aim is to help somebody as she passes along the way so that her living is not in vain. It is with great joy that I tell you to prepare for a tremendous preaching moment. You will not be disappointed and we know she will tell you that God gets all the glory. Hear the Reverend Dr. Janet Jenkins Sturdivan as she comes to us with God as her help. God bless you, heaven smile upon you, and thank you for joining with us today. Greetings in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, the one in whom I move and have my being. To the Reverend Dr. R. Guy Irwin, the president of the United Lutheran Seminary. May God continue to bless you, President Irwin. And may in doing that, may you get all that you need and are able to accomplish the vision that God has given to you. I pray only the best for you. I also want to thank my brother, in ministry, ministry, Reverend Albert Johnson. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. And I appreciate being able to work with you in the city of Philadelphia in our denomination. I know your work ethic and a lot can get done and a lot has gotten done. So thank you so much for your kindness towards me. 
To my husband, Reverend Michael Wayne Sturdivant, our children, our grandchildren, and our godchildren, I want to thank all of you for your support of me, but particularly Michael, who you just never say no, you never try to block anything that the Lord has for me to do. I love you and I appreciate you. Finally, to my bishop, the Right Reverend Julius Harrison McAllister Sr. And to our Episcopal Supervisor, Mother Joan Marla McAllister. Bishop, I thank God for you. I follow your leadership and I appreciate the opportunity to serve with you in the First Episcopal District as a member of your cabinet. To the South District pastors of the Philadelphia Annual Conference in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Pastors, you know how I feel about you and congregations, I know you know I love you all as well. Thank you so much for supporting me. Thank you so much for being here and for praying for me. For the Reverend D. Albert Turk, Ministry of Evangelism in the First Episcopal District, for all the conference chairs, all the conference coordinators and area facilitators, it's my pleasure to serve you and all the evangelists as the director. Thank you for being here today. And to St. John AME Church, the place where I'm serving as your interim pastor, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. And God is in charge of all that we do. And I appreciate each and every one of you who is here with me today, just edging me on and encouraging me. Thank you so much. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, it is once more and again that we have this great and awesome privilege to come before your presence and we do come with thanksgiving. We enter your courts and we do enter them with praise. We honor you, we reference you, we depend upon you. And God, we do trust you because you are our Father, which art in heaven. Father, I pray that even though I'm seen, you will be heard. And I do pray that the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart will be found acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And I do pray after the preaching of the word that signs and wonders will follow adding to the church, such as should be saved. In Jesus' name, it is we pray, amen. Go with me, if you will, to our scripture for this afternoon. The Gospel of Mark, the fifth chapter, verse 24 to 34, in the New International Version of the Bible. So Jesus went with him and a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she only grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in a crowd and touched his cloak because she thought if I could touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around and the crowd in, in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answer, and yet you can ask, who touched my clothes? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, 
told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. I would like to zoom in on the 28th verse. If I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. I wanna use as the subject, desperate for a miracle. Desperate for a miracle. She was 16 years old, laying in a bed in Deaconess Hospital in Buffalo, New York. Recovering from major surgery, a C-section. She had carried for nine days a temperature of 104. That Friday, the hospital orderlies came and they began to move all the women who were in the room with her. There were about four all together and they moved all of the women out except her. The doctors were carrying on and she didn't find out until afterwards that the reason they were moving everybody out was they were sure she was going to die. Nothing they did could get her temperature to break. She was unable to see or to hold her little girl. Now that child was nine days old without even feeling the warmth of her mother. This young girl, this young lady was isolated. And when her visitors came to see her, they had to put on a robe, they had to put on mask, and they had to put on gloves if they planned to visit her for 10 minutes. She laid in the bed lonely and confused and in pain. IV in one hand, unable to really walk at surgery, was really in pain and still had a headache from her spinal. She was a church girl all her life, but she had never had a personal encounter with God. She didn't know that even though she believed in God and loved God and was saved, she never had a personal encounter where God did something personal for her. So one day, probably the 10th day of this situation, she looked up and looked out the window at what she knew to be the labor room. And she prayed a prayer to God of negotiation. It was something like this. God, if you let me see my daughter, and the only way she could possibly see her daughter was for her temperature to break. If you let me see my daughter, I promise you, I'll do such and such and such. This was her simple prayer. When she woke up the next morning, she felt different. She felt normal. She felt something had happened in her body. So when the nurse came around to take her temperature, she asked the nurse, what was it? And the nurse said, you don't have a temperature. And she said, take it again. And the nurse said, as if she was upset, you don't 
have a temperature. I know this story is true because it's mine. There may be those who say it would, would have been a matter of time and my temperature would have broke. I don't think so. They had done all that they could do for me. I needed a touch. And I looked to the hills from which came my help and my help came. I looked in desperation to Jesus to touch me. And that's exactly what he did by the power of the Holy Spirit because I was desperate for a miracle. In the text this afternoon, this woman's story is intertwined with Jairus, a synagogue leader's interaction with Jesus. He came and laid at Jesus' feet, pleading for him to lay his hands on his daughter and heal her because she was dying. Jesus consented to go and to see about his daughter, but on the way he was approached by a woman with a chronic illness. She was subject to bleeding and had been in this state for about 12 long years. In Luke's account, he tells us that Jairus' daughter was 12 years old as well. So about the time that Jairus' daughter was born, this woman's illness began. While his daughter was being fed as an infant, held and taken care of by her mother, this woman was bleeding. When his daughter spoke her first words or took her first steps, this woman was bleeding. When his daughter learned to feed herself and run around and play, this woman was bleeding. When his daughter had her first birthday, her second birthday, her third birthday, this woman was still bleeding. When she had her fourth birthday, her fifth birthday, her sixth birthday, this woman was still bleeding. When she had her seventh birthday, her eighth birthday, her ninth birthday, her 10th birthday, her 11th birthday, this woman was still bleeding. And now by the tender age of 12, his daughter was dying and the woman had now been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Both of their lives were hanging in the balance and each of them sought relief from Jesus. The father wanted Jesus to touch his daughter, but the woman wanted to touch Jesus. The Bible does not tell us the woman's name. However, we know a few things about her. She was Jewish because Jesus referred to her as daughter. She had a chronic illness, bleeding on and off, and this therefore rendered her as unclean, ceremonially unclean, according to Leviticus 15, 25 and 27. Being unclean meant that as long as she was bleeding, she was ceremonially unclean. For 12 long years, she was considered unclean. Anything she laid on, anything she laid on, anything she sat on, anything she touched, anyone who touched her 
anyone who laid on anything she laid on, anyone who sat on anything she sat on was considered unclean. And what they would have to do is they would have to wash their clothes, take a bath, and they would be considered unclean until that evening. She didn't have any type of life. She could not be sociable with people. She was unclean. By now, this woman was emotionally, physically, and mentally drained, going back and forth to doctors with no improvement, no relief, had to be frustrated. She had to be frustrated. Her, her hair, if she had any, was probably she wanted to pull it out because where she was going for help, there was no help. In fact, the Bible says that instead of getting better, she actually grew worse. To add insult to injury, she was broke. This illness wiped her out financially. She didn't have any money left over. No healing, no money, no support, no companionship. She was a broken woman. She was an outcast of sorts. Can you sympathize with this woman today? Or maybe some of us may even empathize with her. If not our health, our finances, our close relationships, our addictions and dependencies of children, spouses, parents, we may be able to testify with her because it's been a long time that we too are desperate for a miracle. This woman knew her condition. She knew the law of Moses. She knew she had no business out among the, the crowd of people. She wasn't supposed to be out. And if just one person she touched, she wasn't supposed to touch anybody. So why in the world did she go out? Why did she jeopardize everybody in that crowd that she came in contact with? Why did she chance running into somebody who knew her and being therefore thrown under the bus and surely they might have exposed her and ridiculed her because she was outside of where she was supposed to be and around people that she definitely was not supposed to be around. But why did she do it? She did it because she was desperate. She was desperate for a miracle and nothing was going to block her or stop her. Have you ever been desperate? Have you been, ever been desperate for a supernatural intervention into your human situation that only God could do? I mean, not what man does that is not long lasting, not what man promises to do, but have you ever been desperate for God to touch your life in one way or the other and you knew only God could do it? Have you ever been so desperate that you were willing to do whatever it took to get a miracle, break religious laws, step out of your own comfort zone as far as race, as far as creed, as far as color, as far as gender, as far as social status was concerned? You wouldn't let anything deter or hinder you from you moving towards your miracle. No obstacle was too big. Nothing would block your way. Have you ever been that desperate? You didn't care what people thought. You didn't care what people said. You had to go for yourself because the only one who could do it for you was God. Jesus was her last resort. She was out of money. All human assistance had failed her. However, she had three things going for her that would help secure her miracle. The first was that she had heard about the miracle worker. 
Jesus. What did she hear? Maybe she heard Jesus open the eyes of the blind. Maybe she heard that Jesus unstopped the deaf ears and loosed stammering tongues. Maybe she heard that Jesus fed the 5,000 plus with two fish and five loaves of bread. Maybe she heard that Jesus raised a lad that was on his way to be buried in the cemetery, but Jesus got him up. Maybe she heard that Jesus even cleansed the lepers. Maybe she heard that Jesus cast out demons. I don't know what she heard, but all I know is the Bible says that she heard about Jesus. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God. Therefore, my sisters and my brothers, we need to begin talking about Jesus. We need to begin testifying about the goodness of God in the land of the living. We need to tell everyone how we made it over. We need to give our testimony. So even though they see us dressed in white, dressed in black, have on collars, even though they see us with titles and uh, letters before our names and letters after our names. We need to tell them that I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters he lifted me. Now safe am I, love, lift lifted me. And the one who lifted me was Jesus. We need to tell somebody. We need to tell them how Jesus set us free. We need to tell them how Jesus lifted us up. Secondly, the one desperate for a miracle, she believed what she heard. She believed what she heard about Jesus. She said to herself, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. She put her trust and hope in Jesus. The songwriter said, my hope is built on nothing else but Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. What faith? What faith? What faith? Think about it for a second. She just said, if I touch his clothes, I will be healed. She was convinced what she heard was true. And she received it in her spirit. When she saw Jesus, she reached for his clothes. And the Bible says, immediately, immediately, without hesitation, when she touched Jesus, something happened. And she knew she could feel it in her body, like I could feel it in mine. She could feel that the bleeding had stopped. She could feel that she was free from her suffering. In an instant, she felt it. The minute she touched him. And when I awoke, I knew something different was going on with me. The third thing she needed to, to get that miracle was to put her faith in action. Why do I say this? And is this the case for every miracle? I mean, does God just, just only bless us if we move towards him? Is that the way every miracle is? I don't know. I can't say. But what I can say in this case, it was necessary. As we read the gospels, we often see where Jesus was preaching and teaching and healing among massive crowds of people. I liken the crowds to those who followed President Obama when he was campaigning for the presidency. It was amazing to see how many people followed after him. People were everywhere. 
just try to get a glimpse of him or get a look from him, wanting to hear him speak, some waiting in long lines, some waiting in an inclement weather just to get a glimpse of him. The crowds were massive and just as massive as they were maybe for Jesus. But crowds are interesting. Some in the crowd followed Jesus just to see what he was going to do and just to see what was going on. They were in the crowd to see, but they did not want to be seen. Zacchaeus. Some in the crowd followed Jesus, not because they were with him. So that's why you can't get excited when you have a crowd, because everybody in the crowd, even though they're in the crowd, may not be with you. Many times over and over again, we see where the religious people were in the crowd only looking for things to bring up against Jesus, evidence of things they wanted to charge him with. They weren't supporting him, but they were in the crowd. We know some in the crowd had to be sick. She wasn't the only person in the crowd sick because when we look at the gospels, he was always ministering to people in the crowd. There was always people in the crowd. There were people in the crowds that were sick. There were people in the crowds that needed deliverance. There were people in, in the crowds that wanted a miracle. There were people in the crowds that needed something. But were they maybe too scared to come forward? Maybe they were looking for Jesus to turn around and do something in their behalf without them having to say anything. Maybe they tried to get close, but because it was so many people, they were pushed away. Or maybe the crowd had its own agenda. And that's the problem with crowds because they can become a crowd and then they can become a mob. It can change on a dime. You have to be very careful about crowds. One minute they're saying praise and the next minute they're saying crucify. The woman was there not to be seen though. She wanted to be healed. She wasn't making a cameo appearance in the crowd. Hey, I'm, I'm with everybody. You see me, I see you. She wanted to be healed. She wasn't there just for the sake of being there. <laughs> she had an agenda. She wanted to be healed. She heard, she believed, and now she was going to get her miracle. Once she touched Jesus, however, she moved out. She moved away, maybe trying to hide, maybe trying to go back home without drawing attention to herself since she was not supposed to be there in the first place. Or maybe she, she just didn't want to, to stay any longer. Maybe she was just so excited she wanted to go home and share it with somebody because now she was going to be able to be close to people. I don't even know if she thought that Jesus would know that she touched him with so many people. The disciples even said, Jesus, what are you talking about? Who touched you? What are you talking about? And maybe she thought that Jesus would not even know. You see, the disciples, they didn't even understand how Jesus knew that she had touched him. They didn't realize that when he said that, he was saying more than just the words. Oftentimes, the words from God speak to us on one level. Our intellect does not comprehend because God's words are spirit and they are life. We have to elevate our minds and move into the spirit. The disciples weren't there yet. They did get there on the day of Pentecost. Jesus knew that power had left him. The Greek word for power here is dudamus, meaning something extremely powerful. When it left him, Jesus stopped in his tracks. <laughs> he knew somebody touched him and whoever touched him 
They were deliberate when they touched him. They were desperate when they touched him and they were determined when they touched him. Whoever touched him wanted what Jesus had. Nobody in the crowd that day touched him the way she did. They may have bumped against Jesus. They may have rubbed against Jesus, but they did not take what he had away. They did not grab for a blessing. Glory to God. You see, you can be present when the move of God is in the place. You can be present when the spirit is flowing and blowing like the wind and not receive anything. If you want to experience God, if you want to experience a move of the spirit, then you have to open your heart and your spirit to God. And so when the spirit is flowing, you have to open yourself up so that he can come in and bless your life. I don't believe we say in the church sometimes that that uh, you should have been here because uh, the Lord really blessed us. Uh, you should have been here. I don't believe that God would have my blessing where I wasn't. But we can be right in the church and the spirit can move and we can miss him. We can miss his move. But that woman, she saw Jesus and she grabbed for the power. 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 Because she knew only Jesus could fix this thing for her. This wasn't the first time we've seen desperate people in the scriptures. Jacob, he wrestled with the angel. And he said to him, let me go, for it is daybreak. That's what the angel said to him. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. <laughs> he wrestled with that angel. Uh, 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 no, no, you ain't going nowhere until you bless me because I've got to face my brother and I need a blessing to face him. Hannah cried out to God at the altar for a child. And she said, Lord Al Almighty, if you only look on your servant mis misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give me a son, then I will give him to you, Lord back to you all the days of his life. She just wanted to have a baby. She just wanted to have a son. Hallelujah. And she said, I'll give him back to you. She was just so desperate. I don't even have to keep him. I'll give him back. And God blessed her with many more children after that. Esther, Esther was desperate. After Mordecai came to her and told her what was gonna happen to the children of Israel. And she said, okay, you all fast. You all fast, don't eat anything and don't drink anything for three days and three nights. And after that was done, she said, okay, I'm going to see the king. And if I perish, then I perish, but I'm going to see the king. And even after his fall with Bathsheba, even after he failed, God and what he did. King David wrote in Psalm 51 11, he said, God, don't cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. He didn't want God to leave him. He didn't want God to take his presence from him. He said, I know I did wrong. I know I sinned against you, but don't leave me. Don't leave me by myself. Stay with me. Give me your spirit. Keep your spirit in me. Don't take it from me. Sometimes, church, when we are in the midst of the crowd, it may appear like we are the only ones focused. We are the only ones seeking and appreciating the presence and the move of God in the place. This may be true because others may not come looking for a move of God or looking for what you're looking for. You don't always need a crowd. You don't always need a crowd and nor do you need to always be doing what the crowd is doing. Go for yourself. Praise God for yourself. Seek God for yourself. When she touched Jesus, 
She obviously was a woman with an agenda. Her mind was made up. Her faith was determined. Her hope was pure. She was after her miracle, her healing, and no one, no one was going to stop her. However, Jesus put her on blast, not to embarrass her or not to shame her. She had that done already for 12 long years. This might've been why she hid. She didn't want anyone to know what had happened to her and they might recognize her and they might create a scene because she was out. Maybe she hid because it had finally happened and she just really wanted to get the news out and get home. Is it possible that having uh, paid the doctors and, 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 and went back and forth to doctors and she didn't have any more money and she paid for them to do it and they didn't do it and now Jesus had done it? Was it possible that she might've thought, well, if I paid them and they didn't do it and he did do it, Maybe he wants me to pay for it, but you don't have to pay God for your blessings. You don't have to pay God for your blessings. I know that you can see on different stations that you need to send in this to get blessed. You ain't got to do that. You don't have to, you don't have to send in money to get blessed. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. And if God gave it to you, nobody can take it away from you. But Jesus, because I believe God keeps track of his power, he knows who has it and he knows what we're doing with it. If we're using it for ourselves or if we're making ourselves church stars or church celebrities, or are we using his power to build up the kingdom? to do greater works than he did because Jesus said that we would do greater works than he did because he's going to his father. After Jesus was persistent, she came forth. And when she came forth to show herself, she came forth with fear and trembling. She came forth and she was confessing. She came forth with a spirit of humility. She fell at Jesus' feet and told him, the whole story. I can imagine that she began by telling him, Jesus, some 12 years ago, something strange started to happen in my body. And I thought it would only last for the normal period of time. But Jesus, I saw where it just kept on flowing and, and it just kept on flowing and it went from one year to another year, to another year, to another year. And I thought I needed to see a doctor. So I went to a doctor and the doctor said, just do this. And, and I did it, but it didn't stop my bleeding. And then I went to another doctor because my friend told me that he knew exactly how to solve my problem, but I had to pay more money. And I went to him and it worked at first, but then it didn't work anymore. And I kept going to the doctors and I saw Jesus where every time I turned around, I was bleeding. And Jesus, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to handle this. I was getting tired. I was getting weak. I was getting worn. And then I couldn't be around people. And, and, and there were people who knew what was going on with me. And they didn't want to be around me. And then I became isolated. And I just, I just couldn't take it anymore, Jesus. And somebody told me about you. Somebody told me that you were a way maker. Somebody told me that you were a healer. Somebody told me that if I came to you, you would not turn your back on me. Somebody told me that you were able to heal, that you were able to deliver. Somebody told me that if I could get to you, I'd be all right. And so Jesus, I just sort of believe that. I believe that if I could just get to you, I would be all right. And so that's why I went up to you, Jesus. I left my house today. I knew I wasn't supposed to be out. I knew there'd be a lot of people around you, Jesus. I knew it because they were always around you. I spied you out a couple of times. I spied you out a couple of times, but I, I, I just was too nervous. But today I said, I'm coming. 
And so I put my clothes on Jesus. And I just thought that if I could just, just, just get close enough to touch you and, and nobody really see me, if I could just do that, I knew that I'd be okay. And then when I did, I thought that I had gotten by, but then you turned around and you said, who touched me? And Jesus, I'm sorry, I got scared. I didn't know what you were asking that for. So it was me. It was me, Jesus. I did it. I did it. But I praise God because I got healed. When, when I touched you, what was in my body left me. When I touched you, what was in my body left me. And I started feeling normal again. I felt like a, a regular woman again. I felt like I could be clean again. I felt like that, that tag that's been on me for 12 years had just come off of me. I, I, I'm so grateful, Jesus. So grateful. Can I keep it? And Jesus said to her, Daughter, the power of God left me, yeah. The power of God left me and came into you, yeah, but it was your faith. It was your faith, the faith that brought you out the house. The faith that caused you to put your clothes on today. It was your faith. Your faith that, that made you whole. I want you to go home in peace. I want you to go home in peace. Because you are freed from your suffering. You won't ever have another day like the days that you have had. You are free. I want to know today, whether you're a man or a woman, it does not matter. This word is for anybody who is desperate for a miracle. I want to know, are you desperate because of what's going on in your home, on your job, in your church, in your community? Are you desperate because of what's going on with your children, your grandchildren? Are you desperate because of what's going on in our country, in the city of Philadelphia? Are you desperate because you just want to see God move? Because whatever has been going on has been going on too long. Can I encourage you today? Unlike this woman, there was a crowd around. She couldn't get to Jesus. She had to press her way. She had to maneuver. But you and I don't have to do that. We have a high priest who has told us in Hebrews 4.16, let us approach God's throne, his throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The woman, the woman said to herself, if I can just touch his clothes, I will be She was desperate for a miracle. She got hers. It's time for you to get yours. Thank you for joining us. And now I invite you to share a gift if you are moved by God's spirit to support our students who are studying and preparing for ministry. On the screen are ways that you can give both online and via U.S. mail. 
Our main scholarship that supports all of our students in the Black Church concentration is the J.Q. Jackson Scholarship. We ask that you consider a gift to that fund. But you also have an opportunity to support students who are members of the Church of God in Christ through the Bishop Ernest C. Moore Scholarship Fund, and then African-American students who are members of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America through the Grover and Irma Wright Scholarship Fund. I have made this request to our alumni this year, and so I ask our friends and all who are watching to give above your normal gifts this year. At least consider $40 above that amount that you normally would give in light of our 40th annual Preaching with Power. And so as you consider a gift, I thank you in advance for your gift and your support for our seminarians who are preparing for ministry. And please know that this gift is both temporal and eternal because when you invest in a seminarian, you invest in ministry.